Amen. Thank you, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. When you came in, you should have been given a bulletin inside. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege of worship and the opportunity we have to gather together here today. Lord, the plans that you have for us, even this day, we want to be a part of them. We want to be drawn into them. We want to see them clearly. So now, Lord, we come before you, thankful for this privilege and opportunity. We come desiring to hear from you. Speak to us, guide and direct us. May our worship be honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, as we lift our voice in praise to you, may it honor you. But may the words of these songs also speak to us, and may your word impact us this day. We have come into your presence to worship and adore you. Let it be so now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? Would you turn to those around you and greet each other this morning? Lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Please be seated. At this time we have a, a special privilege this morning. And I'm going to ask uh, moms, dads, babies, we're having a Dedication of children this morning, so those who have agreed to be a part of that, if you guys want to come. Let me, uh, let me introduce, and I've got notes just so I don't make a mistake. <laughs> this cute little thing here, sleeping away. She likes my voice. Puts her to sleep every Sunday. <laughs> this is Julia Jean Wright. And mom and dad, Jennifer and Patrick Wright. So uh, they're coming this morning to dedicate her. And next, we have Zoe. This is Zoe Odell. And mom and dad, Lauren and Daniel Odell. Oh, look at him. All right. Let me get them all right here. This is Connor. Correct? Correct. Connor Watkins, Mom, Jenny, and Dad Blaine. And this young man is Colton. And Dad Jed. How are you this morning, bud? He doesn't want to turn around and look out at everybody. And then we also have Eden, Dan Danielle, Reed. And mom and dad, Erica and Bobby. And then young man, big, big brother. Right? Is that right, Gabe? He's the big brother here. <laughs> and so uh, this morning, what, uh, what we are doing, this is a time of dedication. Um, this, is, this is when we are, uh, these families are presenting their children before the church, but before the Lord, and making a commitment to raise them up in a godly home that will point them to Jesus and encourage them in that relationship as they grow up. But this dedication is more than just for the family. It is for us as a church family as well. And we come before them during this time because we are family, that we will support and encourage and help them in training up these young men and women to be godly young men and women who make a difference for the kingdom of God. And so uh, this morning in this dedication time, uh, we're going to uh, give the parents an opportunity to make a commitment before the church, but also the church to make a commitment back to them. And so if you will listen, 
um, I, want to, I want to share a couple of passages of Scripture with you first when we talk about raising the children up in godly homes. And out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit at your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. That's our responsibility to one another. But then also out of Mark chapter 9, it says, And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking them in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me not receives not him who sent me. Right now, I want to ask the parents. In presenting your child to the Lord, do you promise in dependence upon God's grace and upon the partnership of the church to teach them the truths of the Christian faith and to set a Christian example before them, to bring them up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord and to encourage them to accept Christ as their Savior under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? If you do, will you just please respond by saying, we do. She's fine. <laughs> Congregation, do you as members of First Baptist Church promise to join these parents in teaching and training of these children that they may be led in due time to trust Christ as their Savior and to confess Him in baptism and church membership? If you accept this responsibility, will you please indicate it by standing? Let me pray for these families and these children as we dedicate them to the Lord this morning. Let's pray together. Father God, as we come before you right now, thank you. Thank you for the precious gift of life that you have given. Thank you for these children. Lord, we pray for these parents as we dedicate these children to you. We pray that these parents will be equipped and ready to teach and to train them, to raise them up in a godly home, to point them to you. I pray your blessing upon the family as a whole. I pray that you would encourage them and lift them up and draw them into you. And Lord, we thank you for a church family that supports each other, that encourages one another, and that will be a vital part of these boys and girls coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Bless them richly, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And before you leave the stage, let me... You can have a seat, I'm sorry. All right, where's Connor? That's all right. Zoe, this is yours. You want this? There you go. All right, Eden. You want to hold this for sister? Colton. There you go, bud. And Connor. Where'd you get that? I don't either. And Julia. All right, thank you so much. You can all go back and have a seat. Yes, good job. Yeah, give a clap. On holy lean, on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When we walk.
walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. What a glory He sheds on our way. Let us do His good will. He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. Bow with me in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pause this time to lift up these tithes and offerings, to spread your good word around the world. Be with those that are not with us. Be with the pastor as he delivers this message. Give us a good day, good service, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. It is a special day for a lot of reasons. And... Uh, you know, as, as I think about life, God has given us so many examples of what He wants to do in our lives all around us. And one of those examples that I was drawn to this week as I considered uh, this morning and our time of baby dedication and, then, and here in a little bit we're going to celebrate new life in another way through baptism you know, I was reminded of, of what God has done in creation and in nature. And, and one, one specific thing that, that came to mind was the life of a butterfly. And uh, I guess the reason is because of what takes place in the life of a butterfly. Did you realize that there are four different cycles that... A butterfly experiences in its life. It starts out, it's an insect, it starts out as an egg. And when that egg is hatched, out comes this caterpillar. Now the caterpillar, you know, some, some boys and girls like, like those little fuzzy woolly worm caterpillars and the, the black and the orange on them. And, but most caterpillars really aren't that appealing in appearance, if you will. But they go through a cycle of life as a caterpillar, walking around and limited on where they can go and what they can do. Basically, they eat a lot. They'd be good Baptists, wouldn't they? Um, they spend a lot of time eating because they need that to grow, just like you and I do. We eat to grow. We take in to grow. Same way with God's Word. We grow in our relationship with Him by taking in His Word. But there comes a point in time when that caterpillar stores up enough food and goes into that cocoon. Spins that cocoon and spends a period of time in that cocoon. But as you are well aware of, there comes a time when it breaks forth from that cocoon. And I want you to think about the transformation that takes place there. The metamorphosis that, that transpires in a butterfly's life that goes from that limited, unattractive caterpillar to this beautiful butterfly who has next to no limits on where it can go, what it can do. No longer does it have to crawl along the ground, but it flies through the air. You know, that transformation that takes place in that little insect, God put that together. And the reason that that comes to mind is because the life that we see in that caterpillar is representative of your life and of my life. And if God put that much effort and can make that big of a change in that insect, what can He do in your life, in my life? So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about new life. New life. We've celebrated several new lives here already this morning with our baby dedications. We're going to have another baby dedication because that wasn't all of them. 
believe it or not. Isn't that a good thing? Praise the Lord. We're going to have another baby dedication coming up the end of the month. So if you want to be a part of that and, and haven't let us know yet, please let us know. We'd love to have you be a part of that and, and uh, dedicate your children to the Lord as well. Um, but it's easy for us to realize the joy that these new lives have brought. You saw the smiles on these parents standing up here before you. And it wasn't because you look pretty or beautiful that they were smiling. It was because of that new life they were holding in their arms. The joy that new life can bring. But in our lifetime, I want you to understand something this morning. In your lifetime, in my lifetime, we have the privilege of experiencing that joy in new life twice if we so desire. That information about the butterfly is symbolic of what God has done for us. And so that's what I want to look at this morning very quickly. I want us to just spend a little bit of time talking about new life and what God has given us. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them to Psalm 139. The first thing that I want to focus on that God has given us is that God has given us life. He's given us life. Psalm 139, beginning with verse 13. If you'll follow along as I read. For you formed me in my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we enter into your word this morning, as we talk about what you have given us, and especially focusing on the new life that you have entrusted to our care, I pray, Lord, that you would just give us that nourishment that we need from your word. Show us what you have to say to each one of us today. Whether we realize it or not, Lord, you brought us here this morning for a specific purpose. Oh, some came to celebrate a, a baby dedication. Some came to celebrate a, a baptism. Some came out of habit and tradition. Some came to truly experience worship and experience you, Lord. But you, you, Lord, had an intention for every single one of us here today. You have us here because you have something you want to say to us individually. And so let us hear. Let us hear what you have to say. Let us not be consumed by thoughts of what the rest of the day holds or worry or fret. But let us just stop and listen to you and gain insight from you this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. He has given us life. I think in this passage that we just read, there are, there are three specific things I want you to recognize about the life that God has given you. He gave it to you. You were born. You are here. Life was given by Him. But the first thing I want you to recognize, and it's in verse 13, is this. You are complex. You are complex. You know, one of the reasons that I shun the idea of evolution is because I have a hard time recognizing that this 
can process itself out of some single cell organism that was so simple that there was nothing to it other than that one single cell. And it developed into this? Really? The, I, the idea that out of, out of mush came this as well as that boulder that's half buried in your front yard. And you're going to say those just happen to evolve that way. Do you know the complexity of your eye? I mean, have you ever stopped to think about the complexity of how your eye works? Do you realize that the vision that you see takes everything and it turns it upside down? Your eye is rounded. Have you ever looked through one of those rounded or in one of those rounded mirrors how everything's upside down and discombobulated yet you and I through this are able to see what's here it's transferred through this eyeball onto the back of your eye transferred up to your brain and your brain is able to allow you to see things as they are we are not simple individuals this is not a simple thing that God has put together. God formed you and made you and knit you together. Specifically as you are. Now there may be things you don't like about yourself. There are things that I don't like about myself. I really wish God would have given me eyes that lasted a little bit longer in good shape. I'm thankful for doctors who have given me glasses to be able to see you. But I really hate them. I'd like to get rid of them. Not because of how they look. I just, I used to survive very well on my peripheral vision. Now, you know, if I want to see something, I have to turn and look at every little thing. You are a complex person. And I'm not talking just about your personality. I'm talking about how your physical body works. I want you to recognize what God has done in you. He specifically put you together. Have you ever seen, you know, we're talking about, we've talked about illustrations a little bit of the butterfly and the illustration that it gives us, but we see a lot of that in, in people who, who sew or do needlepoint or knitting or things like that, how they can create from just these strands of thread these beautiful designs. Or how a painter can take these colors and pigments and put them on a canvas and just make us in awe. That's what God did with you when He gave you the life that you have. It is very complex. And then in verse 14, we see that you are also unique. <clears throat> now take a look around. Look up and down the pew you're sitting in. There may be similarities to someone in that pew. Because family's probably sitting together. Donna had a, had a discovery this week as she was posting family pictures on Facebook. You know, Facebook now has the ability to identify faces for you. Well, the problem she's having is every time there's a picture of me or Caleb or Joshua or Andrew, Tim got the better looks. They're all identified with me. My name comes up when their picture's shown. Wasn't that funny? Oh. <laughs> Those who have known me for a long period of time can see that. I'll never forget when we sent my mom Caleb's first grade class picture. She told me her initial response was, why is Willie sending me his first grade class picture? Now, this is my mom. <laughs> we have resemblance. But even though there is resemblance, you know, you can tell, there is a distinct difference 
between us. Even twins have distinct differences. Each and every one of us is unique. God gave you that uniqueness. There is no one in the world just like you. And that's a good thing for a variety of reasons, which we aren't going to go into this morning. But understand, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, when he says that, what is he saying? I want you to catch something. Fearfully made. You are unlike any other part of creation. There is no other part of creation that is like you and I. We're different. When, God, when you read in Genesis, when God created, He created the trees, He created the animals, He created the waters and the lands and the mountains. He created all of these things, the stars, the moon, the sun. But when He got to us, we were different. Oh, there is a symbolic representation and a presence of God in all of creation. But in us, we were made in the image of God. We were made differently. See, He gave us souls and spirit. We're different than any other creation. I know you may love your dog and your cat and it's part of the family. And that's great. But you are distinctly different. You are fearfully made. You are unique in that way. You're also wonderfully made. And that is specific to you. There is no one just like you. No one. Oh, there may be some people who don't know you as well that may, may mistake you for someone else. You know, they walk up to you and somebody you've never met... Don't I know you? No, I know I know you. I've seen you somewhere. Aren't you so-and-so? No, I'm not. Are you sure you're not? Am I sure I'm not? Yes, I'm sure. But anybody who knows you knows your uniqueness. You're one of a kind. And then the third thing in verses 15 and 16 that we see here, when God gave us life, is that you are intentional. You are intentional. God knew exactly what he was doing and he specifically, intentionally made you with purpose, with design, with intentionality. You are not a random being, you are not just another person. You see, God created you with intentionality. There are things that God desired to do. I want you to picture this for a minute. God is continuing to mold and shape all of creation. And as he's doing that, he says, I would like to do this. Some item that God wanted to make happen in creation. And you know what? You know how he did that? He created you. He didn't create you just to live. He created you to fulfill a purpose. Your existence is more than just existence. Too many people in this world are just going through the motions of life not realizing that they have purpose and God had intention in their specific life. Every single one of you, God has that intentionality for you. And some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, he did, and I've probably fulfilled that, and, and now I'm just hanging out. No. Realize this. When God's through with you, He'll take you home. When you no longer have purpose, this life will be over. So evidently, God's not through with you yet. Because you're still here. You need to recognize that. And you need to own it. What a treasure we are in who God has made us when He gave us life. 
But the second thing that God has done for us that I want to draw your attention to this morning, and that is the privilege to be born again. Open your Bibles to John chapter 3, if you would. John chapter 3. I want to uh, read this passage of Scripture, two short passages here that I want you to follow along if you would. Let's begin with verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you do not hear the sound of it. And you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then drop down to verse 16. A passage you are familiar with. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that He, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We have the privilege not only of receiving life from God when we are conceived and born, but we also have the privilege of being born again. Now, three things I want to draw your attention to out of this passage. We've got to have balance, don't we? So we'll have three things here of being born again. Number one is, it says, of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit in verses 5 and 6. See, when you were born, you were born of water. But you were born incomplete. You were born body and soul. But something was missing. And that's what the passage says when it says, "Flesh, born of the flesh is flesh. But born of the Spirit is spirit. We are without the Spirit until we are born again. We lost that in the garden. Adam and Eve lost that for us. Now we can't blame it all on them because sin is a net nature for us. You don't have to teach a child to lie. It comes pretty naturally for self-preservation. But the Spirit is what we were missing. And so we need to be born again of the Spirit. To be made complete. The second thing when it talks about being born again is born again in belief. Look at verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him That's where it comes from. Belief is not just knowledge. It includes faith. It requires faith. Faith is believing in what I cannot see. Trusting in God. I can't this morning put down on paper, if we were to have a a court case here, I cannot, and you were the judge, I cannot put down on paper and give enough concrete evidence to prove to you who Jesus is and what He did for you when He died on the cross. 
I cannot prove that eternal life comes through knowing Jesus. That comes by faith. It is a choice to believe. Now I can give you evidence in my life of what that has done and how that has transformed me. And that should be admissible evidence. But on paper, I can't line it out. I can't prove it out. It requires faith. What do you believe? You see, God has given you life when you were conceived and when you were born. God offers you new life when you are born again. But that is your choice. See, all these children up here that you saw this morning didn't have a choice. They were born. They didn't have a choice of what family they were born into. God chose that. But now the choice is yours. When it comes to being born again, it is your belief, your choice of what you will choose to do with it. God has provided it, but you have to take action in belief. And then in verse 17 and 18, the result of being born again is that you are free. You are made free. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes is not judged And he who does not believe has already been judged because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. When you are born again, you become free. Free from what? Well, you're not free from sin. Because we still stumble and make mistakes, right? But you're free to make the choices every day of your life. You're free to live to the fullest. You're free to be complete, body, soul, and spirit. You are free from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell. That's what being born again is all about. That's the new life that Jesus gives. So God has given you life, At conception, God has given you the opportunity for new life once again in being born again. Each and every one of you have experienced the life God has given you in the flesh with a soul. Every one of you has the opportunity to also be born again through faith in Jesus. If you have received that free gift, if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior... Will you just give a shout of amen to the Lord? What a grand testimony. For those of you who could not yet shout out, I wonder. I wonder this morning if you'd like to be made whole today. If you'd like to be made complete. Body, soul, and spirit. In a few minutes, we're going to be celebrating with a special young lady who has recently been in your shoes. But made a decision for herself to ask Jesus into her life and to be born again. Today she'll be standing before her church family to follow in believer's baptism in a symbolic act showing her new life in Jesus. What about you? Do you have that new life? Have you been born again? This is the time in in every church service that so many of you dread. It's that time when the pastor calls out for people to make a response to what God is saying to them. And some of you are here today and you couldn't shout out amen because you haven't chosen to be born again yet. What's stopping you? I know one of the things that stops many people. It's other people. Now, it's not anything that they've done. It's not anything that they've said. It's just our fear. Our fear of what they will think of us. After all, people know me. 
And what would they think if I suddenly went forward in the church service and asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior? If you've heard my testimony, you know that that was a powerful part of my testimony and a sad part of my testimony. God's grace protected me for probably two weeks from the day that God called me to be born again when I literally grabbed a hold of the chair that I was sitting in that Tuesday evening and I held tightly to the sides of it when that pastor said, if you want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, stand. And I held on with all my might. By God's grace, I had another chance. That's not always the case. But here's what I learned. I learned that there was no one who ridiculed me for the decision that I did make when I made it. My fear at that moment when I held on so tight was what will everybody think? The result after I made that decision was that everybody thought it was a great thing. And they celebrated with me. So let me tell you this this morning. If you're here right now. And you have never been born again. You can look up and down the pew. All around you. You can even look at the person sitting right next to you. You may have been with them most of your life. But let me guarantee you. They will celebrate with you. If you choose to be born again. And we will too. Don't let the enemy cause fear to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. If you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you want to be born again. This is your birthday. Will you decide to do it? But as you heard the shouts, many of you already know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You have been born again. So what is God asking of you today? There are a variety of things that He may be asking of you. Maybe He's asking you to have the courage of the young lady you'll see in a few minutes to stand before her church family in believer's baptism. If you've never followed in believer's baptism... Isn't it time you give a testimony of your faith? Are you born again? Jesus said, how can I confess you before my father if you will not confess me before others? Isn't it time that you made a statement of your faith as God has called us to? Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Now, I'm not flying to Jordan to baptize you I'm sorry but we can do it here if we need to go find a river we can go find a river we'll wait until a little warmer day but will you give a testimony maybe it's time you join this church family you've been coming for a while you know this is where God has you you know this is where God wants to use you what's holding you back be identified with the family Maybe there's other decisions. Maybe, maybe this morning you just need to come and spend a moment in prayer and say, God, thank you for the life that you have given me twice. Let me treasure it as you do. I don't know what you're going through, but I know this. There is not a single individual here this morning that God did not bring here for a specific purpose Because he had something to say to you. Please do not get out those doors today without knowing what that is. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the
special time as we celebrate what we've been talking about this morning. We want to put the concrete action to what we have heard, and so we are doing that this morning. So, come on now. testimony means something to you this morning as well because that's what it's meant to do it's not that difficult but the most important decision you will ever make in your life is whether or not you choose to be born again so I would encourage you with that Mark's got someone to introduce to you 